All right. So hello, hello everyone. We're we're live with the the one and only Dustin Crummett, and then the second one and only Richard Chapel. Uh, Dustin, th they're both philosophers. I feel like I should have prepared like an explanation of who you both are. They're both they're both good at good at philosophy. Dustin's doing something with insects. Uh, uh, he's working for some organization about improving insect welfare. And Richard is a professor at a university in Florida. Okay. Yeah, okay. University of Miami it's in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Richard is also the author of what many are calling the second greatest blog uh, about <laughs> philosophy on Substack. The first one I unfortunately can't name uh, due to reasons of modesty. But... Con conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to be talking about psychophysical harmony and moral knowledge. Uh, so Dustin, do you want to start by just sort of like explaining what the puzzle of psychophysical harmony is? And Richard, you can uh, weigh out your solution. Yeah, uh, I can try. Um, often when I give these short descriptions in YouTube videos, people uh, don't quite get it. But, you know, there's a longer paper that Brian Cutter and I wrote and uh, so forth. But um, so the, the, the problem of psychophysical harmony or sometimes people call it psychophysical luck, um, this is, is recognized as a problem for epiphenomenalist dualism in uh, uh mainstream philosophy of mind. You find people talking about it. Um, and in fact, you, you often also find people offhandedly saying things like, well, obviously you could solve this if you believed in a benevolent God or so, you know, and then they, they kind of, but who does that? Right. And then they move on and talk to other things. Um, so uh, it, it's not like we, uh, we made this up, but um, what we do, I think is, is, uh, try to show the real seriousness of the problem and uh, show that it, it afflicts. We argue ultimately that it afflicts um, a wide range of views in philosophy of mind, not just epiphenomenalist dualism, but really everything except um, forms of physicalism, which deny even a conceptual distinction between the mental and the physical, type A physicalism, those sorts of things, which I think are, are inconsistent with things that we are just directly acquainted with and so they're they're sort of non-starters um and then we we take seriously the the oh well you could solve this if you believed in a benevolent god part right um so what's the problem i mean i i think richard and i are both dualists so I'll, it's it's easiest to explain if you just assume dualism so uh on dualism you've got like the mental you've got the the or sorry you've got the physical you've got the mental sort of like painted on uh in some way uh and it's like this is a there's a con contingent connection between uh the physical and the mental um <clears throat> that connection could have been otherwise uh and in fact it could have been like any any which way right um you could have had uh anything happening at the mental level um while keeping uh the physical uh fixed um and that means you know, if you just think about like all the possible <clears throat> phenomenally conscious states you could be in, um, the overwhelming majority of those are just like trash, right? Like mo most of the visual fields you could have are just random static. Uh, and then like, mo like diachronically, most of the sequences of visual fields you could have are just like randomly progressing random static and so on for, for other, other sense modalities and other, other types of experiences. Um, so like the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming, overwhelming, overwhelming majority of psychophysical laws uh, would just give you trash phenomenology, right? Nonsense, nonsense mental states. Um, uh, and would give maybe any possible conscious being, uh, you know, any, any physically possible conscious being just nothing but nonsense trash mental states. Um, you might think some uh, laws are more intrinsically probable than others, but if you try to go by, say, simplicity or maybe naturalness or something like that, I mean, I guess what would really be simplest would be um, uh, just no phenomenal consciousness, right? We're just philosophical zombies. Uh, it would also be pretty simple if you imagine 
maybe the laws just map like every mental, every brain state onto like the same very simple phenomenal state or everybody's just having the experience of phenomenal redness all the time. Or maybe just, there's only one mental state, like the whole universe is just experiencing phenomenal redness all the time or something like that. Um, or one thing that a lot of people have found quite odd about uh, the mental and specifically about dualism is this idea that um, you have basically like these strongly emergent sui generis properties um, that supervene upon these kind of vaguely defined macro level properties, like no other natural laws work that way. Um, and so you might think uh, it would be more probable, say, that uh, the, the uh, mental just supervenes directly on the microphysical. Maybe, you know, panpsychism is true, but there are no macro level conscious agents. Or maybe uh, there are macro level conscious agents, but our phenomenal states just directly mirror what's happening at the micro level. So again, you get just trash uh, phenomenology. Um, so uh, the thought is, um uh it, all, all those all those worlds uh are worlds where there's like maybe no value or at least there's much less value maybe there's even negative value if it's bad to just be like totally crazy uh and stuff um and uh and yet it looks overwhelmingly probable we think that one of those worlds have just you know uh is selected uh if the world isn't in some way ordered towards realizing value one of those worlds would be the the world in our initial presentation of the argument, we made some further assumptions for which people on the internet have taken us to task, extremely controversial, unmotivated assumptions, uh, you know, only driven by apologetic considerations, things like external world skepticism is false and uh, pain is bad and, and things like that. And if you grant us, if you grant us those admittedly logically coherent to reject assumptions, uh, then there, there's even more interesting stuff that's happening because it looks like not only are our mental lives sort of internally coherent, but they also reflect uh, physical reality, right? So I, I have an experience as of uh, a, a, a phone and sure enough, there is a phone. And sure enough, I'm, I'm disposed to say things like, uh, I'm having a phenomenally conscious experience as of a phone, and uh, I really am. Um, uh, we're disposed to pursue valuable mental states and uh, uh, avoid uh, uh, disvaluable mental states. If there's something that's like to have intentional states, beliefs and desires, um, then you know, I get up, I walk to the fridge, I have a beer. Sure enough, my phenomenology is oh, it's the there's a beer in the fridge belief phenomenology and the I would like a beer desire phenomenology so that uh, the, the cognitive phenomenology um, is is fitting in a way that that allows us to, to predict my behavior using, you know, human belief, desire, psychology, etc. Um, Brian made a big taxonomy of a bunch of additional uh, kinds of, of fortunate matches uh, once um, and maybe that will be published sometime. But um then the thought becomes well you know so like psychophysical harmony very valuable what allows us to to have the potential to flourish to exercise agency to not just be totally crazy to have personalities all this sort of stuff um uh so very valuable if something's you know astronomically unlikely uh to obtain just by chance but it's very valuable you might think oh so maybe it obtained because it was valuable and then you might think, okay, maybe somebody made it obtained because it was valuable. Somebody wanted something valuable to happen, right? Um, and so the thought is, uh, there are, you know, there there are a, a variety of different views on which the universe, in some way, is ordered towards producing value, axiarchism, etc. But uh, one of those views is theism, and that entails maybe God would be interested in. Um, producing psychophysically harmonious beings because of the value of them. God would be able to because God's very powerful, et cetera. Um, and so the thought is, 
it serves as a kind of Bayesian argument in favor of theism and other views on which the world is somehow ordered towards the production of value over and against naturalism and other views on which the world is not somehow ordered towards the production of value. Yeah, so, and, you know, there's, there's more to be said about it. The, there's the paper on it linked below. If your thought currently is, well, what about evolution? Doesn't that explain it? No, it does not. You have not understood the problem properly. The problem is about why the mental states and the physical states pair the way that they do. And so if if they pair it in a different way, but you could get radical disharmony, but the same physical states. And so the question is why they pair harmoniously. Uh, so explaining it in terms of behavior doesn't explain it any more than you could use evolution to explain why gravity is the strength that it is or something like that. Yeah, I've, I've encountered people who assumed that Brian and I must be young earth creationists because it was just so obvious that this problem would be solved by evolution that we, we must have known that and just... Yeah, I, that, that would be sort of funny if you had an argument for theism that assumed the young earth creationists. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I would do that dialectically. Uh, pr premise one, God made the, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve in it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, Richard, do you want to explain your your solution to this puzzle? Sure. I mean, I've got, I guess, two main thoughts about psychophysical harmony. So, I, I think it's just a super interesting puzzle, really fun to think about. Um, and the, the two things that really jump out at me, first of all, I think it's a good problem to have. So I think there's a real problem. There's actually, it's an objection to views like type A physicalism, that it doesn't allow for the possibility of disharmony because it just seems clear that it should be possible to have disharmonious mental states. Like it should be, there should be possible worlds out there where the people's mental lives just don't match up in a sensible way to what's going on in their brains. Like that's clearly conceivable. So just like we think that you could have an inverted spectrum twin, um, we, you could have an inverted pain twin, and that should be a live, like a logical possibility. So it's a problem for views that um, that don't recognize that disharmony is something that you know is is in some sense possible. Um, so it's a good problem to have. Um, but the the problem to solve then is why should we how can we explain why in the actual world things are harmonious? Like, why is it reasonable to expect that a harmonious world would be actualized, given that there are disharmonious worlds out there in logical space? Um, and here, I guess, my main thought is that this is, I think there's a kind of a constraint on the solution that we want. Um, not everyone will agree with this, but at least it seems to me that the kind of solution we should want to this problem is one on which um, the sort of selection of the actual world as being a harmonious one um, should be, in the relevant sense, intrinsic rather than extrinsic. So I'll explain a little bit what I mean by this. Um, so my worry with this sort of theistic response, the idea that like maybe there's a benevolent God out there and he chooses this world because it would be good for things to be harmonious, is that you're appealing to something that's very outside of, very extrinsic to um, the harmony or disharmony itself. Uh, you're appealing to this external sort of factor to, to, to realize the the selection process correctly. Um, and my worry is that that makes it too much like, you know, if you think of other things that like would be bad um, and that we might want a world to avoid, something like wild animal suffering. Um, you know, wild animal suffering is a bad thing, so we should want there to be like a benevolent God that would create a world that doesn't have wild animal suffering in it. You know, that's true. It would be nice if there, if there was such a world and that would be a good thing for, to be realized. Um, but it just doesn't seem to me that the two cases are relevantly analogous because it doesn't seem to me that psychophysical disharmony is merely a bad thing um, that you know we would expect to happen in the absence of a benevolent deity, just the way that we expect um, you know animal, wild animal suffering to occur in the absence of a benevolent deity. Um, it's not like this totally predictable expected thing, and it's just like, well, let's hope we're lucky, and it turns out that the world is better than we would expect. It doesn't seem like that to me. It seems like the dis the disharmonious worlds are weird and wacky in a way that um, worlds containing wild animal suffering are not especially weird or wacky. Um, so that makes me think that the kind of solution that we want should be one on which it's not just that this is a bad thing and then so maybe it would be nice if there was a deity that made this bad thing not happen. Rather, we need to be able to have an explanation of why this is a weird thing, why it's a wacky thing that we should not expect, even in the absence of any external influence like a benevolent deity choosing which world to realize. Now, the tricky thing then is to pick, is to find out 
have an explanation of like, why is it weird? Um, so, you know, like, like Dustin said, it's not obvious that we can just appeal to something like simplicity or some kind of um, content neutral kind of principle along those lines to explain it. Um, I, I agree that that doesn't seem very promising. Um, it seems kind of reasonable to me to just kind of take it as a brute um, just kind of a sort of primitive expectation that if there are to be psychophysical bridging laws at, at all, they should be harmonious ones. Um, it seems somewhat surprising that there is phenomenology at all in the world. Like, why is there consciousness? That's kind of mysterious. Um, I definitely, you know, I probably wouldn't predict it if, if you weren't already conscious. Um, but given that there is consciousness, I think it would be really weird for there to be consciousness, but if, to, for it to be like total static, disharmonious from the, um, from the sort of physical um, underpinnings that give rise to it. I mean, especially if it's brain-based consciousness. So we're not talking about some kind of weird panpsychisty world. You know, maybe those could be a bit more weird staticky. But if we're thinking specifically about a world on which we only think that consciousness arises from the functioning of brains and other sort of sufficiently sophisticated um, cognitive style information processing, um, for that to give rise to, conscious to consciousness that was completely disharmonious with the information that was being processed, that seems extremely weird to me and something that we shouldn't expect. Now, if someone can give an explanation, like a nice sort of content neutral principled explanation of why this judgment of mine is, is right, like sort of validating the principle that we should not expect disharmon disharmony to arise in this kind of case, that would be great. I would welcome such an explanation. But I don't think we need such an explanation in order to recognize that it would be weird to have disharm disharmony arising in this way. And so whether there's an explanation or not, you know, if there is, great. If there's not, maybe we can take it as brute in the meantime. Uh, maybe at the end of the day, it could just be a brute fact, the, sa the same way that some people mm -hmm. might take it to be a brute fact that the, um, the laws of physics are fine-tuned as they are in such a way as to give rise to you know, planets and uh, eventually life. Um, there could have been other, other universes that just didn't form anything at all, like matter just didn't didn't like function right. Um, that's possible. Um, where it turns out the universe is such that planets do arise, and then you might think of a similar kind of thing. You can just sort of take it as brute that um, that either I I mean there are two ways to go. One is to just think, well, we're we're lucky that this happened. But I'm actually thinking more than that. I'm thinking no, we should we should additionally think that it's more likely. Um, and so that might be a disanalogy from the physical fine tuning case, where it's not clear to me that we should think it's more likely that there are physically fine-tuned universes. So that's a tricky issue. Um, but I do think that conditional on there being brain-based consciousness at all, we should expect it. Like it just should, we should judge it to be more likely that it would be harmonious rather than disharmonious consciousness that's um, arising from that. Again, that's just sort of a brute intuition that seems more coherent, seems more sensible seeming to me. Um, and I like this better than the kind of extrinsic explanations because this is something that's just based on the intrinsic content of the of you know the psychophysical relations themselves, not appealing to this external factor um, that seems to me to be treating it too much like very different things, like wild animal suffering. It just seems like calls for a very different kind of response. Um, so those are my rough thoughts on the issue. Yeah. Um... So I, I agree. Uh, I agree that it's weird in like at least some of the disharmonious states are weird in at least some senses, but those senses seem to me to not be ones that are relevant to intrinsic probability. Um, and then is there some further sense of weirdness uh, in which um, Yeah, is there some further sense of weirdness which is relevant to intrinsic probability? I think I both want to say no and um, want to say, even if there is, insofar as I can grasp it, I, I'm not sure that the disharmonious, all the disharmonious states are more weird anyway. So some senses in which they are weird, I mean, things that are like extraordinarily unfamiliar can be weird, right? Things that violate extremely well-established um, uh, expectations can be weird. Um, so Hume, of course, has the famous example about the billiard balls. Like when the one billiard ball is going to hit the other one, you know right away what's going to happen. It's going to push the other one away. If something else happened, it would be extremely weird. Um, and in fact, it would be so weird that for centuries and centuries of philosophers thought that the alternatives were impossible. 
were like <laughs> literally strictly metaphysically impossible. They thought that like a disembodied intelligence could derive a priori what was going to happen when the one billiard ball hit the other one, right? Um, in fact, I think Hume is right. <clears throat> That's not, there's, no, there's in fact nothing metaphysically deep about the weirdness there, right? What, what happens is just, um, we, know, we know what happens when things run into each other contingently, what actually happens. And that's deeply ingrained in us. Maybe, I mean, I don't know enough about childhood development. Maybe it's even like, it. maybe even before you see billiard balls, you, you just, it, you know, cognitively, you, you, you kind of are primed to expect a certain thing to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that, is, that is based on how things actually work, right? Um, so uh, I agree that disharmonious things are weird in that sense. Um, like if somehow I learned that Richard's phenomenology was just crazy static and we were having this conversation, uh, I would be shocked. That would be deeply <laughs> weird, but that's because it violates everything I contingently know, right? It's not right. something that's relevant to intrinsic probability. Um, another way that things can be like weird or wacky or something is if like something extremely significant results from chance in a way that's super unlikely or something like that. So you imagine, um, I'm, I'm like working in the Scrabble factory and I'm driving a, a forklift pallet of uh, Scrabble boards and I like crash and all the Scrabble boards fall over and the Scrabble tiles uh, spell out uh, exact instructions for making sarin gas and some some terrorist is standing nearby and sees them and writes them down and like, oh my what a what a wacky situation right it's like the worst thing that could have possibly happened there um, but uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily that the Scrabble tiles spelling out exact instructions for sarin gas were individually any less likely than any other equally specific arrangement mm -hmm. that they could have fallen out into, right? Um, it's just that the overwhelming majority of the arrangements are nonsense static, right? The overwhelming majority of the arrangements are just a, a random uh, scramble of tiles so that they spelled out something coherent and it was like oh no the worst thing they could have spelled out um that that seems extremely significant you want to be like oh that could only happen as the result of like a malign intelligence um uh <laughs> bringing that about right um and so i agree some of the disharmonious scenarios um things like uh uh, you know, pain, pleasure, and version scenarios, those sorts of things. Um, those, those seem wacky in that way. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, oh, no, you know, it, 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 I thought we were at least just going to get nonsense static, but instead I've got this extremely uh, specific, hard to get scenario, and it's like one of the worst ones. Oh, no, that feels like it had to be the result of a malign intelligence. Um, but I don't think that itself shows that that scenario is individually less intrinsically probable than any of the many other scenarios we could have wound up in. Um, and in fact, I think that mirrors what's so striking about the fact that we got the, the inverse of the inverse, right? The fact that we got the actual laws. Um, uh, that, that's the thing that, again, makes all these philosophers of mind say, oh, yeah, it's almost as if this is the result of a benign intelligence. And then they scoff and move on, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, is, is there something else here? Um, I guess, like I said, I mean, you know, one thing you said was conditional on consciousness being this property of complex information bearing systems. You know, a lot of people think that already is weird, right? Um, so that, you know, and that is part of what motivates panpsychism and uh, a limited materialism, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, some some philosophers think, oh, yeah, that's that's what phenomenal consciousness would have to be. It would have to be this sui generis thing that kicks in. At the, and like, that's just so that's so bizarre. It must just not exist. So we must be the philosophical <laughs> properties. Um, right. uh, and uh, so, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to think this, like the actual state of affairs is is pretty weird. It's just, it doesn't feel weird because of familiarity. Um, and some of these other scenarios, 
you know, really, they feel like they would be much less weird. Or like even, again, you know, you could imagine consciousness being a property of, of brains, high-level information processing systems, but somehow the conscious properties mirror the microphysical structure. Um, and like, you know, that might seem less weird in a way. Um, I guess I'm also, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too... I'm not too hot on the idea of like weirdness as a determinant of intrinsic probability. Um, um, maybe, maybe that will kind of launch us into another, another discussion. Maybe I should pause right here and then I want to say some stuff about that, but. Sure. Um, yeah. That'll, that'll be good to follow up on. So, yeah, I mean, I guess just sort of reflecting a bit more on, on some of the maybe core issues underlying our disagreement. So I think one thing that I find very striking is the way that you talk about the issue. It's almost like you've got a background assumption that like um, all the possible laws are like balls in a, in a bag, right? It's like mm. a lottery and like you pull one of the balls out and those become the laws of nature. And like, if they're all these, all these balls, like you should expect them to be equiprobable by, by default, right? And so yeah. whichever one gets pulled out, it's like, it was so unlikely that that one would be the actual one any particular one would be extraordinarily unlikely. And so then you have this argument, just like the Scrabble one that, well, wow, the ball that got pulled out is one that's like pretty significant to us. It's not like one of the random nonsense ones you'd ordinarily expect. And so we need a special explanation of how it was that a significant law of nature was, was actualized. Um, and I guess I want to reject that picture, uh, the picture on which there's a mechanism for realizing laws of nature that, that is, treats them all as equiprobable to begin with. I think that's very misleading. Um, so, you know, it's not as though there's a, there's the start of time and then at like time T1, we need to go through this process of determining what the laws of nature are gonna be. And that's like a chance process. And then the laws of nature are determined at that point. And then we can like reason backwards and be like, well, it would have been so unlikely for this one to be realized. You know, that's not what happened. Um, it's just the world is what it is uh, and always has been. Um, so, so I do want to resist the assumption that we have to assign equal probability by default to all of the possible laws. I just think there's nothing stopping us from thinking, um, no, it's just much more reasonable seeming. I should have like a, a prior according to which um, the, the sort of coherent harmonious kind of world um, just as a priori much more probable than the weird disharmonious ones. Um, and I don't think the I mean, you might just not share that intuition. That's, that's fine. It's hard to argue about priors. Um, but insofar as you want to like offer a debunking explanation of my intuition and say, well, it's just familiarity. I don't think that debunking explanation works um, because something else that would be very unfamiliar would be zombie worlds, right? Um, but I don't think that zombie worlds are wacky or weird in the same way. Um, I think there's a really significant intuitive difference between worlds where there's no consciousness at all, which just seems very natural to me and understandable. And I'm mm -hmm. like, wow, it's a great thing that our world contains consciousness like that. That does seem like a cool, lucky thing. Um, and comparing that with harmonious versus disharmonious worlds within the ones that are conscious. Um, because I really do think that when I reflect on the space of possible worlds, uh, I mean, I don't know like how to like estimate, like what's the likelihood, what's the a priori probability of consciousness existing at all compared to like non-conscious worlds, ones with no psychophysical bridging laws at all. I've no idea how to answer that. Um, but I do have a strong intuition about the conditional probability of harmony given consciousness, particularly given the sort of information-based consciousness that we have, not panpsychism as mentioned before. And there I really do think conditional on uh, consciousness arising from brains and similar information processing systems. Um, we should just be much more confident. We should think it's much more probable that it would be harmonious than disharmonious. And we should have give, we should assign sort of vanishingly tiny, negligible a priori probability to disharmonious worlds. I think we should give significant a priori probability to zombie worlds. Very unfamiliar, like it's not like we take our world to be, but it's a world that makes sense. I could see how that could, like, how, how a world could be that way. But the disharmonious worlds do just strike me as weird and wacky in a way that the zombie worlds don't, um, despite both being equally unfamiliar. So there's something else there. Um, again, I don't know the best way to explain it. Um, you might just not share the intuition, in which yeah. case my argument's not going to be much help. Um, but I'm at least in terms of explaining my own position and like why I think going with just sort of the brute a priori um, credibility here, there just seems to me a real difference between these cases. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so certainly I agree. You don't believe in a mechanism that's selecting the laws. Um, I think that might make it worse, though, because a mechanism can be biased in some way. <laughs> uh, whereas 
if if there's no if there's no mechanism, then then it's kind of like what could uh, make some more likely than others, right? You might think that's an argument for uh, indifference reasoning. Um, in fact, the mechanism might be an agent who wants there to be a uh, slight <laughs> right? Um But uh, yeah, I, I guess we should talk about the the idea of, and th th this leads into the thing that I said I would put off talking about. We should talk about the idea of like weirdness as an, a determinant of intrinsic probability. Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't get that unless it's, um, you know, really, unless it's supervenient upon some of these content neutral principle, you know, unless it's a, a thing like saying the scenario is convoluted and, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're assigning, uh, you're dividing up properties in a non-joint cutting way and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't get that. So in your, um, in your blog post, as I recall, you tried to motivate that by saying that that's what we should say about why we're not in skeptical scenarios. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I was thinking about that. Um, I'm not sure that that works. Um, so yeah, so this, this is something that I wanted, I mean, think about the fact that, you know, some skeptical scenarios, like the first thing that ever happens is you're in a skeptical scenario, right? If the world was made five minutes ago, then first state of affairs is just, oh, we're in a crazy skeptical scenario. Others are not like that though. Others, you start out in a non-wacky scenario and then you move into a wacky scenario. Okay. Uh, so imagine, you know, Sam Altman having, uh, purged, uh, the open AI board of, of the effective altruists who were holding him back. He decides he's going to make the matrix. Um, and then like, oh, there will be a wacky skeptical scenario. Uh, it seems like whether that comes about should just be determined by, you know, the technical competency of the open AI researchers, whether they listen to it, that should be determined by a bunch of previous things. Um, and so, uh, I guess it doesn't seem as wacky, right? I mean, just the idea that like a matrix world could be created doesn't seem as bizarre or like gerrymandered or like just problematic in the same way that like just the world popping into existence fully formed with all this false evidence. Um, oh yeah, yeah, they I, seem pretty I, I, yeah. I, I can say something about that in a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I was just going to say. So it, it seems there like. At least some skeptical scenarios we need to say something else about anyway um and so i'm not sure it's at least not like a fully general solution to skeptical scenarios sure i also worry sometimes whether whether things are like wacky skeptical scenarios depend on things that seem to me like intuitively they shouldn't affect the intrinsic probability so um whether whether the whether the matrix is a wacky skeptical scenario is a matter of philosophical dispute, right? You have people like Chalmers and uh, Hillary Putnam and whatever who think, no, I, I, most of my beliefs about the world are true in the matrix. There really is a phone because my my term phone, it, you know, refers to virtual phones. There is a virtual phone. Really what I'm wrong about is something about like the metaphysical nature of the phone, but like we grant that we could be wrong about those sorts of things. Um, but it doesn't seem like, you know, even if we imagine a, a, a scenario where like first thing that ever happens is everybody's in the matrix. Um, it doesn't seem like, you know, what the right causal theory of reference is should, should determine the, the uh, intrinsic, pro should affect the intrinsic probability of that scenario. Or like, you know, there's some, there's some argument for thinking like, if you uh, if you're in the matrix from the time you're a baby, you're not in a skeptical scenario. But if you just unbeknownst to you, you were put in last night, you are in a skeptical scenario because like reference shift hasn't occurred yet. But it doesn't seem less intrinsically probable that like uh, that because of that, you know, matrixes where people get put in a, 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 as adults are are less likely. Um, so. Yeah, I, I I wondered what I wonder what you had to say about that that sort yeah, of yeah sure so so I think when thinking about whether something is a skeptical scenario or not I think I would want to focus less on my own experiences and more on the ex, the description of the world as a whole right um, and, and sort of assessing the wackiness or whatever um, so yeah I mean for for 
reasons of epistemology and stuff, we like to focus on the, the first person case and be like, well, what sort of situation should we expect to be in? And could we rule out that we're in some, that we're in a simulation or something? Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe we can't. Um, but I think if we sort of ask the question, would it be like unbearably weird for the world to be such that we created simulations and or someone at least, you know, someone created simulations and some conscious beings then existed in those simulations. That doesn't seem weird at all. Um, so I think it's just not a skeptical scenario in the sense that I'm interested in. Um, even if, know, it might be for some other purposes, but it's not what I'm calling a, a wacky or weird scenario. Even if as a result, you know, 99.99% .99 of conscious beings wind up in situation yeah where they're uh, it just doesn't that doesn't seem so weird to me yeah yeah so i mean it, you know some people could think that that was a skeptical scenario for for other purposes so given their um if they are especially concerned to be like living in the bedrock level of reality or something and so they would take themselves to be massively deluded if they were in a simulation um then that could be a skeptical scenario for for purposes of assessing that and so they could be troubled by it in certain ways um, but it's not the sort of thing that i think we could should automatically assign low credence to um I think that you know it's very hard to know how to address the simulation hypothesis. I don't have a settled view on it, um, so I, I'm a bit sort of agnostic about that kind of case. Um, whereas something like the world, you know, the the fundamental level of reality was created five minutes ago, complete with false memories and false fossils and all that. I, I think we should have very low credence in that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh... one question for Richard. So like. If there was a scenario where we were that where we were all in a simulation, but these were very small simulations, so the people around us mm -hmm. were not were not real. Mm -hmm. uh, Solipsistic simulations, yeah. 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 Do you think that that where that just the vast majority of people were in simulations like this? Do you think that would be a skeptical scenario? Um, so I think it would it would be a skeptical scenario for purposes of like evaluating your life and like what you care about i think um but but for purposes of like the sort of um our determining whether it's a wacky scenario um i would say not necessarily you'd need to tell me more about the the fundamental level of reality and how it was that it, um these solipsistic simulations came about but you know it seems plausible enough that we could end up creating such things and it wouldn't be that wacky for us to do so um so that doesn't sound it doesn't sound like the kind of thing that we should give intrinsically very low credence to um, so but it's it, not a it's not a wacky scenario. Yeah, but it sounds like your argument for your, for why we should think wacky worlds are less likely is you say this provides a really nice explanation of why we shouldn't think we're in skeptical scenarios. But if there are all sorts of skeptical scenarios that it doesn't provide an explanation of why we're not in, uh, then that seems to limit it, its explanatory power. And you're, you're pointing out that these scenarios are skeptical but not wacky. But mm. it, if there are scenarios that are skeptical and not wacky, then that means that having a low prior in wacky scenarios is not sufficient to get a low probability of skeptical scenarios. Yeah, so it might not be sufficient. So I guess I'm maybe wanting to just remain neutral on the sort of um, simulation type skepticism and whether we should have an overall low credence in that or not, I'm just neutral on, I don't know. Um, but what I do think is that we should have low credence in um, wacky scenarios of the like the world just popped into existence five minutes ago type and given that we should have the kind of uh, that kind of response that shows that we're already committed to having certain kinds of priors which give more weight to some possible worlds than others and don't just treat them as all equally likely and so since we're already comfortable doing that in that sort of case i think we should be willing to do that in other sorts of cases which seem relevantly similar and it seems to me that the psychophysical disharmony is relevantly similar and that we should similarly just give it low credence as, as just a, as a matter of our priors yeah so i yeah I, it, it does feel yeah, if there are all these skeptical scenarios, it doesn't help with any way. It does seem to me that that, that weakens. Maybe it, maybe the thought is that it helps with these other skeptical scenarios that I'm inclined to think that we have perfectly adequate alternate explanations. So, or at least I, I hope so. Um, so, you know, in, in the five minute ago case, the five minute ago case uh, that where the world was made five minutes ago, you know, that feels to me um, a bit like the case where the Scrabble tiles spell out uh, the formula for sarin gas, right? Um, right? 
you know, if the world, just on the assumption that the world was made five minutes ago, that gives you no reason to predict that everything is going to be exactly as if it was made 14 billion years ago, right? right. Um, and so uh, the all of all of our evidence about the, you know, about the world around us, um, you know, the fact that all my memories match up with each other, the fact that uh, you know, I, I thought I was supposed to have a conversation with you now. And like, oh, yeah, I'm having a conversation with you now. The fact that like, oh, I remember that I, I have cats and like, oh, yeah, here's a cat, you know, looks the same color as I remember. Um, all this stuff is evidence for the world being older than than five minutes ago. The 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 hypothesis is specifically constructed to present to 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 predict all of that evidence. Um, by building in, oh, everything is just as if uh, the world was made five minutes ago. But of course, to in doing that, you just pick like one very specific right. uh, world out of the much much larger class of worlds where the world was made five minutes ago. And so there's a corresponding um, decrease to to intrinsic probability. Um, and so I'm I'm hopeful that like that's enough to deal with the uh, the five minute ago world. Hypothesis. So I think it's not enough. Let me give a, a quick a quick yeah. case of why I think that might not be enough. So um, I guess the question is, what should we expect as the ratio between, you know, uh, of worlds <laughs> that started when they seemed versus worlds that started later than they seemed? Um, and so that it just seems like there's a really quick argument to think there's a lot more possible worlds that started later than they seemed, um, because it's just one timeline that goes from, you know, the Big Bang to now. And, you know, one of those worlds started right at the Bing Bang. And then there's every other single moment in that timeline, which has a corresponding mm. world that starts then and then continues. And so there's vastly more of the latter. And um, so if they're all equiprobable to begin with, you should think it's vanishingly unlikely that it started with the Big Bang. Yeah, 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 maybe that's right. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't want to say that, yeah, so there's some there's some question about how, how we, what I just said a minute ago depends on like how we partition the, right. the probability space and so to speak, assign probabilities to the different bends, right? Um, uh, and yeah, the hope would be maybe something like uh, simplicity considerations, other content neutral considerations will favor the yeah. Big Bang worlds. Um, I, I I do I do agree. Uh, by the way, I, I don't mean to say that. Um, that indifference reasoning is enough in it for intrinsic probability, right? I, I do agree that we need some principles that result in uh, some uh, worlds being, in some cases, much, much, much more likely than others in order to get um, good results. Um, yeah. I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical about the idea that they're going to result in the harmonious worlds being um, sufficiently more likely uh, in terms of yeah um, so it's yeah. so it's interesting so i mean i think i kind of agree that it would be nice if we could have content neutral principles that will explain the what i think of as an, as sort of intuitive common sense priors priors to have here um i guess maybe where we differ is that i'm more committed to the common sense prior than i am to needing to have content neutral principles to justify it. So I think it would be nice if there are content neutral principles. I'm agnostic as to whether they are, whether there are. So if they're available, that's great. I'll be happy. It seems to me they're probably about, you know, it's not obvious to me that the that it's like vastly more likely to have content neutral principles working in the his, history case than in the harmony case. Um, it's just I, I'm kind of agnostic about both. Um, Maybe it's like slightly more plausible in the history place. Like it's maybe a bit more of a challenge for this for the psychophysical harmony one. Um, but it seems like both. I'm kind of agnostic about both. I don't think it's obvious that either works, and it's not obvious that either doesn't work. Um, it just seems like a big open question to me. Um, but despite it being an open question, how we explain it, it doesn't seem to me that it really should be an open question um, whether we should regard these different possibilities as all equal probable. I think we we definitely shouldn't. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, so I, I, I do agree that we shouldn't, we shouldn't regard all the probabilities as, as, uh, all the possibilities as equiprobable. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the, the question is just Even like, conditional on, uh, no theism. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the question, well, uh, conditional and no theism, I agree that we shouldn't 
consider all the possibilities that were probable. It's just that might work against us because some of the most probable ones will be disharmonious states of affairs. Um, or at least that's that's the way that that Brian and I Brian and I want to argue. But right. um, yeah, we we may have we may have reached uh, bedrock disagreement. Yeah. Not, uh, yeah. One question, Richard. What do you make of the the following argument for why uh, disharmonious worlds are wacky? Where if there are two things where there's no necessary connection between them, then if they happen to align in some way, then that is that's wacky. So, for instance, if you know there's no necessary connection between the strength of gravity and the length in inches of my foot, and so it would be sort of wacky if there was this exact correspondence between the, them. And then you say uh, that if uh, if anything other than type a physicalism is true, type, maybe type B, ignore type B physicalism, uh, then there isn't a necessary connection between uh, between the facts about consciousness and facts about the physical states. And so then it would be wacky. Now, it might only be wacky in the same sense that uh, the case where it spells out out there and gas is wacky, where that's wacky, but it's it's still probably it's still at, well, just as likely as could still happen. as the other scenarios where they fall, but it would still be sort of un unlikely. Where like it would just be that if there if there are a whole range of values, and then you have two things that are unconnected that just happen to line up, hmm. that that is not a scenario that you should assign a super high intrinsic probability to. Yeah, so I think that principle is just kind of a an overgeneralization. Um, so I think it's a it's a principle that is often true in many contexts, uh, and that's so particularly when you're relating to things where we shouldn't expect there to be any connection between the two, like your foot and the gravitational constant or whatever it was you were referring to. Um, so. Um, so often, often there are things where, like, yeah, our expectation should be to begin with that there's no um, there's no connection between them, um, and so then if we found a connection, that would that would seem surprising. Um, but I wouldn't want to expand that into like a universal generalization to the effect that we could never expect a connection between two things that uh, are not necessarily connected. I think it's possible to have. Um, modal connections that fall short of necessity. I think there can be modally probabilistic connections between two things. So that's just to reject your principle. Um, and I think the psychophysical case is just a very nice intuitive example of what we should think of as a probabilistic, uh, a modal probabilistic connection. Okay. All right. So should we should we move on to the talk about moral knowledge? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So Dustin, do you want to lay out the problem of, of oh, moral yeah. knowledge? Um, yeah, well, yeah, you you and I were talking the other day, Matthew, you know, we, uh, Philip and I, in, in our paper about this, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about moral knowledge specifically, um, but I think all of us are agreed, like, this generalizes probably to some other domains, maybe even to, like, the synthetic a priori in general, or something like that, um, and, uh, that's not, you know, the, the idea that there's some, there's some issue about naturalizing uh, the synthetic a priori. Um, that's not like a, a theist psyop or something. Um, you know, that, that's uh, like a lot, of, a lot of the history of analytic philosophy and of even prior debates between rationalists and empiricists and so forth are kind of driven by the thought that like there's something a little bit weird about having synthetic a priori knowledge on a, a broadly naturalist worldview, right? Um, uh, so it's not just us, but, uh, yeah, what, what is, what is the issue? So I'll, I'll just focus on, I'll focus on moral knowledge, assuming moral realism, et cetera. Um, but also noting, um, you, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not enough, um, to, uh, to just reject moral realism or to be a moral error theorist or whatever, because it's going to affect a lot of other things. And like, really, you probably need synthetic a priori judgments to think that any, any given thing is any more likely to happen in the next second, that, that sort of stuff. Um, humor, humor has a good, a good paper about that. Um, that, that, that's another area where indifferent, pure indifference reasoning fails, of course, because anytime you make an inductive inference, there, there are way more ways that the inductive inference could fail than that it could uh, uh, succeed, right? Um, but yeah, so, so focusing in on, on the moral case, though, um, 
there are kind of two two ways to um, two ways to run the argument. One is maybe more of a, a Bayesian argument, um, and maybe maybe at like a very high level of abstraction, you could just think you know think about like the the Eliezer Yudkowsky arguments about all all the things that uh, even an informed instrumentally rational agent uh, could value, right? Um, it could just be anything, right? You could you could value paper clips, you could value pain, you know, um, and uh, you know. So like, out of all the agents in modal space, uh, most of them them just have like trash moral intuitions. Um, uh, as you begin, you be a Calvinist. Calvinist. What's that? You could be a Calvinist. Yeah, you could be a Calvinist. Uh, you, you, you could. You know, so, uh, unfortunately, some of, some of the agents in the actual world also have trash moral intuitions. But um, I, I think we're I think we're all optimistic about the status of our moral intuitions in the sense that though people sometimes have misleading intuitions and um, can uh, you know make mistakes and are subject to bias and all that sort of stuff, we're all optimistic in the sense that we do think that like. Uh, using our moral intuitions as like the basis for ethical inquiry under favorable conditions, operating in good faith, et cetera, et cetera, ultimately allows us to like get, get pretty good judgments about like the ethical questions that we need to answer or something like that. Um, and, you know, most possible agents are, are not, are not like that. Most possible agents if they try to start doing reflective equilibrium, whatever, on their intuitions, either they're going to get worse, you know, some fraction of them will get worse because, uh, oh, now I'm just even more coherent in my desire to maximize paper clips, or they're going to be, uh, you know, like just kind of, it'll be like a random walk or something. Um, uh, and so, you know, as you fill in more details, you know, uh, about the actual world, the structure of the actual world, um, you know, it becomes less and less surprising that we have moral intuitions roughly like those we do. There's a question about, you know, what sorts of moral intuitions are compatible with like broadly evolutionary history. You know, maybe if snakes became intelligent, they would just be rational egoists or something. Um, but uh, at, at some point it, it becomes not too surprising, but then you might think, well, maybe that's uh, it still feels lucky that we're in a world where, like, the background conditions threw up uh, beings that that uh, for which this optimistic assumption is true, right? Um, and so uh, you can see how the Bayesian argument will go. You just you might think, well, God would have maybe some reason to want want us to be able to achieve ethical knowledge. So um, that condition obtaining is more likely on on theism than than on. Uh, atheism or other, again, other views on which the world is somehow oriented towards realizing value. Um, and then there's another way to run the argument, which is kind of a more in principle argument, um, where the thought would be something like, I mean, assume, again, this is not a necessary assumption, but assume because it makes it easiest, and I think Richard accepts this anyway, assume that moral property is like moral non-naturalism is true. So the moral facts are these, uh, you know, non-physical but causally inefficacious facts. Um, then whatever the explanation for how we have our moral intuitions, it's not anything to do with, with anything about how the moral facts actually are, right? Um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not that we have them, uh, yeah. You know, the, the explanation will be some combination of evolution and cultural evolution and random individual variation and blah, 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 whatever, right? Some natural story um, that doesn't have anything to do with the actual moral facts. Um, and though there are tricky issues about like exactly how to generalize this, it does seem like for the most part, um, if you realize that like your, your purported evidence for something has no explanatory connection to how the thing actually is. You, that's like a defeater for the evidence, right? Um, if you you look at the your fuel gauge in your car and it says the tank is full, and you think the tank is full, and then you realize like, wait a minute, that's this just a sticker, you know? It doesn't it's, it, it 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 doesn't it doesn't uh, have any connection to how much gas is in the tank. Then you should stop. You should stop believing that the tank is full on the basis of that, right? Um, 
And so uh, in, in some contexts, I've given kind of an analogy. This is based a bit on an analogy that uh, Dan Corman and Dustin Locke give. Um, but it's a little simpler than, than their case. So, you know, you can imagine that we have uh, some goblins and the goblins have a very strong intuition that there's this necessarily existent deity um, called the absolute. And uh, the absolute has no power in our world. Um, and that's why life is so hard for goblins. So they have a very nice theodicy. Um, uh, but the absolute does have power in the next world. And so if you're a good goblin and, you know, you're pro-social, you help the other goblins, you participate in raids against druids, all that sort of stuff, um, then you get rewarded by the absolute in the next life. Um, and to the, ob to the goblins, this is all clear as day. It's all deeply ingrained intuition that they've had from birth. Um, and you talk to the goblins and you say, wait a minute, the absolute has no power in this world. So this intuition you have about the absolute, that can't be because of anything having to do with whether the absolute actually exists or not, right? Um, and the goblins say, oh yeah, no, we, we, know, we know why we have the intuition. Um, we have the intuition because goblins, you know, sort of naturally mischievous, hard to get along. The only way that we could have survived evolutionarily was to have something like this that kept us in line, right? The reason that goblin society can flourish and we can survive as a species is that we believe in the absolute. And so we're motivated to help the other goblins, et cetera, because we want um, uh, a reward in, in the next life. Um, and it's, the I mean, the goblins in their position there are some like interesting epistemic properties in light of how they view things. So like if they're right, they couldn't have easily been wrong because the absolute they think is necessarily existent. So he couldn't have failed to exist. They couldn't have evolved unless they had their belief in the absolute. Right. Um, so there are some things they can say like that. Um, and yet it still seems uh, to me. And I think to most people that, there's something very fishy about this situation. And it's not just that, you know, in fact, the absolute doesn't exist. And so their intuitions fail from, from a God's eye point of view to match up with the objective metaphysical facts. Um, it's, it's something that they should be able to see by their own lights from their own situation. Once they realize, look, my intuition about the absolute is fully and, and exclusively explained by these things that have nothing to do with whether the absolute exists, um, then it seems like they should not trust it anymore, even by their own lights, if they have the right epistemology. Um, and the suggestion would be, so it looks like for the naturalist, uh, the non-naturalist moral, real, the overall naturalist, but meta-ethical non-naturalist moral realist, our intuitions are kind of like the goblins' intuitions about the absolute. We have these intuitions um, about these necessarily existent facts, but nothing in that domain plays any role in whether or not we have the intuitions or what the content is. And so if um, that serves as a defeater for the goblins' beliefs, then it looks like that um, should serve as a defeater for uh, the person with a broadly naturalistic worldview and so the suggestion would be, if we think we do have moral knowledge, then it has to be that there's, there's something else going on. Um, yeah, super interesting analogy. Um, so I mean, I guess, I guess my initial thoughts here are that it really makes a big difference whether we're talking about something that's a priori or talking about like updating our beliefs in response to something we have contingently observed, like our own intuitions. Um, and so, I think that the sort of principle you appeal to there, like if you discover that you have updated your belief in, re in response to something which in fact can't have any causal influence on the world, um, then you're making a mistake. Like that seems like a true principle. Um, but, but I think the upshot of that is that um, you shouldn't be updating your beliefs based on your intuitions uh, about a priori things. You just need to kind of have the right priors to begin with. Now, of course, that's not very helpful advice to like tell a thinker, like just have the right priors to begin with, because how can you do that? That's not guidance you can follow. Um, but I think it nonetheless is, is just kind of true and inevitable that, that in a sense, the only way to have any hope of having true philosophical beliefs is to start off in roughly the right place 
and then iron out any inconsistencies and so reach the most coherent version of something in logical space that's near where your starting place was because that's the only way to reach the truth right like i mean there if, if you're talking about things that are a priori and that aren't determined by any like physical um contingent things that could causally influence us you could either you could guess randomly or you could start off where you start off and then try to iron out any consistencies and hope for the best or you could just have no view at all um, so you know some people argue for option three so jason brennan has a really interesting paper on skepticism about philosophy where he's basically arguing for option three you just shouldn't think that philosophy is a truth-seeking endeavor and you shouldn't think it can ever work um but i think that's that's too pessimistic um i mean it's you know it, there's something reasonable about it but i think it's worth trying to have true beliefs i think so i just think in a, in a kind of pragmatic way the best methodology we have available to us is to start off with what seems true and then iron out our inconsistencies to get to the thing that from our starting point is more likely to be true than what we started with and it's not like there's any alternative available to us that's more likely to get us to the right to the to the truth um, than that and so i think that applies to all of you know all of our priori philosophy and that includes morality as well um so i don't think you know i don't think we should regard our intuitions as evidence like in a sense the fact that like something seems intuitive to me doesn't make it more likely to be true any more than like the fact that like something seemed intuitive to hitler made it likely to be true like people could just have completely false intuitions like completely misguided that, that could be as true of me as for anyone um but i think just sort of methodologically there's just not any alternative to starting with what seems plausible because the alternative is to start with something that seems implausible and how could that be a better starting point yeah uh maybe i agree about the methodology um so the issue is just at some point you realize um that there's some sort of pro or the thought is at some point you realize working on the, initially on the basis of what seems plausible you come to believe things that seem to undercut your that, that seem to imply it's not just that you like can't from a god's eye point of view prove that you started in the right place it seems to to give you positive reason to worry about whether you did um and uh then you know uh it might be that the right response is to say well but i'm going to hold on to the idea that i started in the right place but then you might have to modify other things you believe you might have to say change something else about your worldview to make it uh more plausible uh, <laughs> that you started you started in the right place right yeah um, that's possible yeah um and i i guess i mean the the point about uh updating on the basis of intuitions versus just having the right priors um yeah and maybe i need to think more about i mean it's not obvious to me that that will make a big difference i mean there's some story about how you have your priors and like that you have them i i guess they are or are determined by some mental state you have that's produced by some causal history and um so i i think you know, it doesn't seem like it helps if the goblins clarify. No, it's not that I have an intuition about the. It's just I my prior in the absolute is very very high. And, you know, because right. um, yeah, it seems like you can say the same thing. Um, yeah. No, I mean I don't think there's any content neutral way to establish that we're being reasonable. Um, yeah. It's a, just a substantive question. So I think you know, um, we've, we've got our, our judgments about what our priors should be in things like the absolute and so we're going to disagree with the goblins and think they're being pretty unreasonable um but i don't think there's any way that we could prove to them that they were being unreasonable and, and, and in the same kind of way i don't think anyone could prove to us or at least you know to sort of my style of non-natural as of non-naturalism um that um that our prior that like pain is bad is is like unjustified yeah um, it's so just the, it's, it's a real you're really getting to philosophical bedrock there and it's just very hard to to sort of push further at that point yeah so the the issue is not about um just to clarify the issue is not about proving to the goblins that uh their uh that their belief is wrong or something like that right on grounds that they'll accept um the the thought is that uh on grounds that they do in fact accept it seems like they should be able to see that their belief is unjustified because they they see that there's no explanatory link um and you're i guess you're just denying that right that's right yeah i'm, yeah. Think, I'm thinking their response should be to say 
yeah, there's no that we don't have any like empirical contingent justification for this. We're just responding to a priori credibility. Um, and the only way to do that is to just try to think as clearly as you can about the issues and form your best judgment. That's always fallible. Maybe we goblins are wrong about the, how credible the absolute really is. You know, that's what that's what we think about the goblins. Um, but I think they can consistently say, yeah, this, this is what seems subjectively credible and self-evident to us. Let's hope okay. we're not wrong. Yeah, maybe that, for them, they are wrong, but we can still hope for ourselves. Maybe I'm missing something about the dialectic, but Richard, it sounded like earlier you were suggesting that that you were saying that there was something significant about it, this being in an a priori domain. Yeah. And so it, it sounded like you were saying that because the goblin's belief was about a, a non-necessary fact and our belief in mortal claims is about a necessary fact, that, it, that explains why we're rational and the goblins aren't. But now it, seem, it sounds like you're saying that the goblins just are rational. Yeah, the, the goblins think be. the absolute is necessary. So it is about a necessary fact if they're, if they're right. Yeah, so, so it just depends what the basis for their belief is. So if they believe that it's necessary because they believe in like religious experience or something, they're like, I had this experience that makes me think it's necessary. And then you point out how brains work and that that couldn't be influenced by like necessary things. Um, then they should revise their belief and say, OK, that was just a mistaken update. I just like had a weird hallucination. And now I realize that I updated for no reason. Um, but if it's not based on like a contingent experience, but rather is just their um, their sort of a priori reflection, their judgment about what's intrinsically credible, where, you know, our, our priors are in some sense essentially baseless. That's what it is to be the prior, that it has no other basis. Um, so, you know, this is just your starting point um, that has no base. And so your base can't be undercut. It's just you're either starting in roughly the right place or you're not. And there's no way for anyone else to establish which is the right answer there. Yeah, I guess that doesn't seem right to me. Um... I think it doesn't, or, or at least, again, clarifying, we're not talking about establishing whether it's the right place. We're talking about whether you should continue to believe that, that it's the right place, even when you- Whether it's the a priori you, right place. Yeah, you come to believe, you come to believe uh, uh, that, um, that by your own lights, there's no explanatory connection here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, maybe we just have a, maybe we've already reached uh, bedrock and we have different a priori starting places. And I, I do, I, I think most people agree with me about the case. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think most people do. Um, I just think they're thinking about it wrong. I mean, one, one thing that might help is to notice that this isn't restricted to the synthetic a priori, right? So you could have the same puzzle about logical truths. Um, imagine all of the possible agents in logical space. Um, most of them would be like completely confused about logic, right? And so if you gave significant probability to like you're not being an evolved creature, but just like being like a Boltzmann brain or something that has just like popped into existence due to some weird quantum fluctuations, um, then you should probably not give a lot of credibility to, to your own like logical acumen your ability to recognize logical truths or analytic truths or anything like that. Um, it's like, just, it's just, we, you know, agents can be wrong about all that stuff. Nonetheless, it seems like our only, our only shot of actually having justified beliefs at the end of the day is to have some kind of default trust in our own mental processing. And so we kind of have to assume that we're not completely logically misguided in order to make any progress at all. Um, so I think we just kind of need to take that as an assumption, which is not to say that it's necessarily substantively justified. You know, there are logically confused agents out there in possible worlds who have very unjustified confidence in themselves. Nonetheless, I just think it's methodologically any agent if they have to have any hope of reasoning philosophically does need to have some self-confidence in their ability to reason. Um, and I think that applies just as much to synthetic a priori things as to analytic and logical ones. Yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, so there, there are a couple things to say. I mean, maybe one, so, so what, what do you think about this case? Um, so like I, uh, Suppose I, you know, today I have like good, uh, normal moral intuitions, whatever. And tomorrow I wake up and my priors have changed. Mm -hmm. And now my prior is uh, that, um, uh, you know, maximizing paper clips is the only thing that matters. Um, and I, you know, I, I realize, you know, I know that I used to believe this other thing, but like, it seems mm -hmm. to me that I've just had, you know, 
a, a sort of gestalt shift where like now I see things correctly. All my right. beliefs are coherent. Um, and then I learn this is how that happens. Somebody snuck into my room and played one of those like sleep hypnosis tapes mm. uh, that that uh, told me that paper clips are the only thing that matter. Um, and it actually um, happened to me yesterday. <laughs> oh, oh no! Oh no! And and furthermore, I I know they have like a, a huge shelf of like thousands of sleep hypnosis, and they just pick one. <laughs> You know, like right. some of them, I would think clothes pins are the only thing that matter. Uh, you know, when I, yeah. uh, um, is it rash? Is it like subjectively rational for me in that situation with that knowledge to say, damn, I'm so lucky that they picked the paper clip <laughs> one because <laughs> otherwise I would have been crazy. <laughs> you know? um, in a way, I think, I think that's why, what, what, what agents are kind of forced to. So, I mean, it's obviously substantively irrational. You now have the wrong, the wrong a priori beliefs. And so I don't think you should think that you should revise your beliefs to have them the substantively more, more rational ones. But I don't think there's any content neutral grounds for establishing that. And we can see that by, by flipping it around. Suppose, you know, imagine instead you started off as a paperclip maximizer, but now you've gotten the brainwashing to become, you know, a nice humane person who, who cares about yeah. others and, and, and wants to like reduce suffering in the world. Um, I think when you learn that, you should be like, wow, that was lucky. <laughs> I'm glad that I've been brainwashed into being a decent person at last when before I was this awful paperclip maximizer. Um, now, I mean, part of the tricky so thing I, here is, I mean, I, you should, as, as you say, if it was like randomly picked from like a thousand different tapes, you should think, well, there was a one in a thousand chance. I mean, if you can even assume that one of the thousand is correct, there's a maximum of a one in a thousand chance, you know, maybe less, of the, but a maximum of one in a thousand that you're going to end up with the tr true beliefs as a result of this brainwashing technique. Um, but, you know, how likely should you regard the prior belief set as being? Uh, if you're previously a paperclip maximizer and there's some explanation of how that came about, evolutionary forces or design or whatever it is, um, you know, human design, whatever. Um, as long as there's not, it wasn't a design that was itself somehow influenced by the moral truths, which I don't see how it could be since they're not causally efficacious. Um, it just seems like you'd have no grounds for thinking that the prior value set that you had was more accurate. Um, so again, it just comes down to working out uh, what a priori is the most credible sort of objectively correct values to have. Um, yeah. And I don't see how you can assess that other than by using your best judgment. Now you've imagined a case where it turned out your best judgment got really badly warped. So, you know, you yeah. were brainwashed into having a substantively bad judgment and that led to bad conclusions. And, you know, that's, that's inevitable. Um, but at least with my methodology, there's a chance that you could end up having the true beliefs. You know, if you're brainwashed or in our case evolved into having um, something close enough to generally decent values, um, then you can actually end up knowing it and having justified beliefs in that. And I'm not sure what alternative there is that would be better. Um, you know, the standard alternative is agnosticism. And I don't really see how you could be completely agnostic about all normative questions. There's no way to really live that way. Um, so, you know, I agree there's something uncomfortable about the kind of um, dogmatic methodology that I'm recommending, in a sense, of this sort of self-trust. Um, yeah. But I just don't know that there's any alternative that we could do any better. Uh, yeah, so it, again, once more, just to be clear, um, at the initial stage, I'm not even questioning the self-trust issue, right? The issue is about once you, you know, maybe you start out trusting yourself and you hope that as you develop your worldview, it's all gonna kind of fit together, right? And then you come to realize like, oh, wait a minute, my, you know, my, my, the, what I've been relying on in this whole domain has nothing to do with, with the truth. Um, then it does seem to me like either you should become an agnostic or you should think, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe one possibility is just saying, oh, wow, I got incredibly lucky, but, or you should think maybe I need to change something else. Right. Um, it, it, it should turn out that, if like me having moral knowledge is uh, kind of like a fixed point in my system um, and, oh, there being no connection between my priors and uh, the, uh, the moral truths um, is incompatible with that, then I could think, oh, so there actually must be some, some connection. Um, and that will push us, the thought is, you'll have to change other parts of your worldview. Uh, that will push us away from naturalism into 
something uh, spookier, right? Yeah, um, I guess my thought is just that the taking yourself to be lucky and having this kind of weird epistemology is, is less weird than the alternatives. So yeah, yeah, it is oh. a tricky issue of that. The you're, you're, trade -offs. Your, your audio got kind of wonky gonna... for a sec. Your, your audio went way down for a second. Um, oh, sorry. Is that better now? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, so sorry. So, so the thought is just that um, there's, there's trade-offs whichever way you go. So I agree there's like some cost here. It's like a, it's a weird aspect of the view that you end up having this kind of epistemic commitment to, to luckiness. Um, but it just seems to me less, um, less weird than the alternatives. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, in in a way that maybe that's maybe we've reached agreement then, because um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. You you know, like I said, there you you could think of this as sort of a Bayesian argument. It it, it is open to you to just say, yeah, fair enough. This is some evidence uh for theism and related views i just think there's other better evidence in the other direction and you know um and then we just have to have a separate conversation about how to weigh up everything at the end of the day yeah um, yeah. yeah i think that's reasonable i mean uh, there's, there's some worries about um i don't know should you regard yourself as lucky to be uh, are you gonna have a similar luck problem though if you're ending up like believing in theism as a result of um thinking that it's the, the way to get rid of luck from elsewhere in your epistemology. Um, that's not a truth indicative reason for believing in God. So in a sense, you would have to be really lucky for that to then end up latching you up to reality. Um, you don't believe in God because God made it the case that it's it would be you, you'd be relying on luck in the alternative um, sort of worldview. Um, that's just an independent fact about philosophy. Um, so your your belief in theism seems to be grounded and uh, seems to be dependent on luck in a similar kind of way. Is sort of the worry. Uh, Why well, I guess the thought is if we just take as fixed that we have moral knowledge and then theism predicts that better. That is truth indicative. It's it's. Uh... Hmm. Yeah, you know, this is just evidence. You can handle it like normal evidence. Okay. Um, I, I think maybe that, so uh, I think that it seems like there are sort of two separate issues. One of them is whether finding out that uh, your beliefs, there isn't a connection between your beliefs and the facts, whether that undermines your justification. And it seems like Richard just, just bites the bullet uh, and thinks, thinks it doesn't. But I think, uh, I think that the, the second part of the puzzle is even if you don't think it undermines your justification, your position seems to commit you to thinking that you've gotten really lucky over and over again. And it, it actually is sort of like a kind of insane degree of luck in an insane number of areas where it's like you're, you got lucky about believing the correct mathematical axioms, the correct modal claims, the correct moral claims, the correct claims, you know, all these are somewhat inaccurate, but the correct, correct, correct claims roughly about the a priori probabilities of various possible worlds, about various random metaphysical claims, like that the prime minister can't be a prime number or that you can't have a color without <laughs> a shape. Uh, that, um, and in each of these areas, there are like a huge number of specific intuitions. Like in math, there's gonna be for each of the particular true mathematical axioms that it's true in the moral domain. There's that each of the particular moral beliefs that you have uh, which there are a bunch because you don't adopt the parsimonious view, you believe in the false objective list theory. Um, <laughs> right. uh, uh, and so it seems like, like there are just uh, this whole range of things, each of which are really, for each of these, you could believe a whole bunch of different things. So it seems yeah. like, like in this case, even if, even if in the, the case with the, I, what was the name of the goblins being? The, the absolute. The absolute. Absolutely. I, used, I used to call it the judge, but I played uh, Baldur's Gate 3, and there they worship the absolute, so I changed it as an homage. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it seems like, like, even if you think that they have justification, if they believed, if they correctly believed in the absolute, and then there was another being sort of like it that they correctly believed in, and they correctly identified the number of heads that it has, and <laughs> they, they got this, you know, all these things right for like 30 different things. It seems like that gives a really strong reason to to think that that their beliefs are explained by the truths in, in some way. There's some connection between their, their beliefs and the truth. And I think that you can, 
you can believe this while being an atheist. Theism is a better explanation of it, but you know, I'm an atheist. I think this is probably right, where you just say that, look, we have some faculty, some innate faculty for grasping the truth about the, about a priori things. Uh, and so, and this enable, like, it just seems like a much better explanation than thinking that we got lucky 50 consecutive times. Uh, doesn't, doesn't your view violate laws of physics? Uh, well, I don't think so. It, it says that the laws of physics currently don't give the complete story. But I think unless, unless you're an epiphenomenalist, which I think you are, but like for, for, for those of us who are non epiphenomenalists, <laughs> like we're going to think that stuff about the mind does violate the laws of physics in that the mind has certain causal properties that are not fully represented in the laws of physics. And it doesn't like break any explicit law, like presumably it'll meet conservation of energy, but it's just that the, that if you think that the mind is fundamental, just just as you wouldn't get the complete story about what uh about what about the laws of physics if you didn't include the effects of electromagnetism or the effect of charge or something else that's fundamental the mind is fundamental and it has certain causal properties and the laws of physics that describe other things won't provide the complete picture yeah i guess it just seems really suspicious to me to be like revising your view about how the physical world works in order to make it convenient to our epistemology um that that there seems something a little bit backwards to me about that um like i feel like something that's a bit um a bit of a limitation of reflective equilibrium is that like sometimes there's a kind of directionality built in to um which ways we can reason. Like, you know, there's this general saying, like one philosopher's modus ponens is another's modus tollens, that they can kind of reverse the reasoning and many arguments. But that's not universally true, right? I think there are some cases where there's a kind of directionality built in. Um, so I think a nice example of this is when thinking about like um, incompatibilism and free will, right? Um, and so there's something fishy, there's something kind of backwards about someone who starts off committed to the idea that we have contra-causal free will, like libertarian free will, um, and, oh, Let's split it into two steps. First, they, they're very confident that we have free will. They're very confident that incompatibilism is true. Um, so free will is not compatible with physical determinism. Um, and so they conclude physical determinism must be false. And they just like infer this without even looking at the world. Like that just doesn't seem like the way to learn about the world. Uh, it's rather there's a kind of directionality that your conclusion about whether we have free will or not should be downstream of your views about incompatibilism and about whether the world is physically determined it or not right so so it's just you have to determine you have to work out some things and other things are downstream of it and so i kind of feel like thinking about the physical functioning of the world um is something that philosophers shouldn't generally be voicing opinions on like it just it shouldn't be it's not the sort of thing that should be downstream of our philosophical theorizing we should rather be taking that as an input um let the physicists tell us how the physical world works and the you know the the neurologists tell us how um, neurobiologists tell us how the brain works and all of that um and then we that's sort of a fixed point for our theorizing and we have to work within those constraints yeah well uh, i mean i don't that doesn't seem right to me. And it especially doesn't seem right. Like, so if you think that part of the thing that counts as data is like the moral and mathematical and modal facts, uh, then, so you think, you know, our beliefs about those are mostly correct. Then there, there isn't anything illicit. If you have this vast coincidence that's explained by having, by positing some fundamental law, it doesn't seem like there's anything illicit about um uh about about thinking that about using the law to explain the vast coincidence like i don't know if uh um Yeah, I, I think, I mean, what, what's funny in the free will case is that it, it seems like maybe what you should do there is give up either on the view that you have free will or on compatibilism. Yeah, uh, exactly. Compatibilism, right. Um, but if you, if you hold those fixed, if you grant that you know those, well, then it really does follow that the laws of nature uh, must be indeterministic, right? You have sort of an effect, libertarian free will, and then you can reason back. Um, and yeah, so, so I guess, I guess the, the issue is that, yeah, you can't necessarily reason back because it's not really legit to hold philosophical claims fixed in that way. Um, they, they always have to be open to revision. Yeah. 
Uh, and so you could think the same thing about our moral knowledge. So if someone's like really troubled by the kind of like yeah. moral lottery type arguments that we've been talking about, yeah, I think that could be a reasonable grounds for being an error theorist, right? I think there's, it's really, it's an interesting argument for error theory. Um, yeah, I think error theory is just kind of hard to accept. Like if it were true, like what, <laughs> what you should do in light of that, like what should you do? There's like no fact there. It just, it, it's, it's in a sense, it just doesn't seem like it's even worth believing. There could not be any reason to believe in total normative nihilism. Um, so there's all these reasons not to be an error theorist. Uh, it seems if there are any reasons at all, then there are reasons not to be an error theorist. Um, but still, you know, I could understand someone being moved by these kinds of arguments to, to become an error theorist, even though there would be no reason for them to do so if they were right. Um, yes. Oh, I, I was just going to say one, one thing is it's not, it's not clear to me that, I mean, in general, to have this view, you don't need violations of the laws of nature. Maybe, maybe the way Matthew is imagining it working, you do. Um, but uh, you could have, I mean, some people want to uh, want to defend some kind of like direct intellectual perception of abstract uh, in a way that's consistent with the laws of nature. Cause like your belief is partially constituted by them or something like that. Um, that runs into some of the same worries that uh, like direct realism about objects run into because it makes it harder to explain. It seems like, uh, you know, uh, more, more like moral beliefs are of the same kind when they're correct and when they're false. And that can't be that can't be right uh, if you have that sort of direct intellectual perception. Um, but you know another another I also worry that it ends up being kind of a verbal a verbal variant of epiphenomenalism yeah, in a way yeah. if you're just kind of gonna say or well, let's call the belief the thing that's the like the the combination of the neural state and the, right, the neural right. correlates and the and the qualia but right. know, the qualia are still completely epiphenomenal you're just referring to this complex now right um, and um, yeah the neural part of it has causal powers i agree right um yeah but then you know the, uh, i mean another way would be i think what matthew is imagining another way would be you have intuitions just like you 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 think we have intuitions and the causal story insofar as like natural history is concerned is the same but you know god thinks god set things up in such and such a way or the axiarchic principle or the natural yeah. teleology or whatever um so in general making the move you know doesn't doesn't uh automatically commit us to thinking that um uh there are um there are no that there are violations of the laws of nature um though uh, again i i think i am inclined to with matthew to think um you know once we're already dualists epiphen it, epiphenomenalism does seem weird and wacky um and you know once we're normal to me. <laughs> our, i don't know why everyone thinks it's so weird uh, yeah. our 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 evidence for uh, for thinking that there aren't violations of the laws of nature in your brain is basically a kind of inductive extrapolation from the fact that we don't see violations of the laws of nature in other places, uh, insofar as we can tell. But like, it's a really weak inductive extrapolation because once you're a dualist and you think, well, the you know your brain is what the mental is super like. If there were going to be violations anywhere, that's where it would be, right? Um, and so. Yeah, I, I don't I don't really find the, the causal closure arguments all that powerful, um, except as a sort of I can feel like the vibe, you know, I, I can feel sort of this thought that like, yeah, but it would turn out that it's causally, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure that there's really strong evidence for that. Um, we should probably wrap up pretty soon, but actually, can yeah, I ask you yeah, about yeah. one last case, Dustin? I'm interested oh, yeah. going back to this kind of um, whether you can regard yourself as lucky sort of scenarios. Yeah. So imagine a case where you're um, you're there. Are, there are two people. One of them, you're one of the two. Um, one of them is given a logical confusion drug. The other is given placebo. Mm. Um, someone comes in and asks you, "What's one plus one?" You answer two. Um, they then tell you you've taken you've had a fifty percent chance of taking this logical confusion drug. Um, mm. How confident I should you be that one plus one is two? Um, I think if I, if I'm, it, I, I'll at least say this, I think if I remain confident that one plus one is two, I should conclude also, oh, I probably didn't take the logical confusion drug, right? right. Yep. Um, and, and it is ultimately, I mean, really what Philip and I want, it, it, we're not arguing that you should become a moral skeptic. We're arguing you should hold on to the moral beliefs and change your other views, right? Um, but you shouldn't become a theist either yeah. just because you're 
believe that one plus one is two and someone might have given you a logical confusion drug or might not have, that wouldn't be any sort of reason for theism. Uh, yeah, that, that wouldn't be a reason for theism. I, I agree with that. Um, but that would be a reason for thinking I didn't get the, the logical confusion drug. Um, and so the thought would so you, be... So you can regard yourself as lucky in this case, right? Uh, yeah, you can regard yourself. I, I mean, it, at least I'm willing to grant that you can, it's fine to regard yourself as lucky in that case. Yeah, so um, my view is just a generalization of that. If, if, there, were, if there were, you know, 10,000 bottles, a million <laughs> bottles, and only one of them didn't have the logical confusion drug, yeah. then you might both think it's harder mm -hmm. to, to consider yourself um, lucky after that. But also... Yeah. If, if I did, if I really, I, ma I maintain my confidence, so I think, oh, I didn't get the logical confusion drug, I might think, oh, the person who gave it to me was nice, right? This wasn't randomly <laughs> designed. This was the product of design. They didn't want me to be logically confused or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, they like you, know. you more than the other um, 10,000 people or yeah. whatever. It's, it's I also, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you, you might think, I mean, logical truths are a little bit, you know, you can feel the force of like, no, this really is almost something like direct acquaintance in like a, a very, you know, I really can see that it has to be true um, in, in a way that, that, you know, the synthetic a priori truths, it's, it's harder to, to see. So you might think that my evidence is different in the logical confusion case. Um, but um, no, I think the badness of pain is in some ways pretty similar in clarity to the one plus one being two. I'm not mm. sure. At least conditional on there being normative properties at all. Maybe it's like not obvious that there are truths here, but if there are, then pain is bad is definitely one of them. Yeah. Well, I am very confident. <laughs> I'm very confident that pain is bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure that it's the, quite the same kind of thing. Um, okay. But even if I'm wrong, I, I don't think it, it ultimately yeah. I so I think there are just really interesting issues here about how, how much confidence we can have and sort of a priori judgments, at least in the case when we're getting it correct. So, you know, if we talk about the person who's now like really confident one plus one is four and they're like, well, obviously I can just directly grasp that one and one is four. So I didn't get the logical confusion drug. You're like, well, yeah. that person's really badly confused, right? Yeah. Um, but, but at least in the good case, um, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's it seems like you bit. can give some extra weight to it. Um, but there's diff uh, difficult trade-offs about how to weigh that against the kind of the higher order evidence of thinking like, well, you know, there really was in this case a physical process with maybe a, you know, one in 10,000 chance you know, rather than 50% in our earlier case um, that that I would end up um, in, the, in the good case rather than the bad case. And maybe that higher order evidence could undercut the, the our sort of our priori confidence to some extent. Um, yeah. So I'm inclined to think we should be, we should probably hold all of our philosophical beliefs somewhat tentatively. Uh, we should recognize that, you know, if we're getting it right at all, there's a sense in which we are lucky about that. Um, I don't know that it's like the the kind of the, the, the million separate pieces of luck that Matthew was talking about earlier. It could be a little bit more systematic than that. It could be just that there are a few kind of core um, kind of um, a few core cognitive dispositions that when combined in the right way will help lead to a lot of different truths. Um, and, and, you know, certainly all the kind of analytic logical ones, I think can probably be explained evolutionarily in terms of like, you know, if we weren't so good at reasoning mathematically and, and logically and so forth, we just wouldn't be able to get around in the world so well. Um, so maybe, maybe there's an explanation for those ones that we don't have to regard as like so fluky. Um, whereas value ones, it's a bit more like uh, we could have had bad values. <laughs> you know, many, many animals have like the analogs of bad values and that doesn't seem to cause them problems. Um, you know, some people do, it doesn't necessarily cause them problems. Um, so that, that's trickier. Um, but yeah, there's just kind of as a interesting connection here between the or trade off between that kind of lack of confidence and in, in, in the external pressures leading any agent of our kind to necessarily have the right kind of mental dispositions like yeah we can't be confident that any kind of agent like us necessarily would be getting things right on the other hand it seems like we're getting things right and it doesn't or at least you know it's not doesn't seem that there's any alternative that's more likely to be right than what seems plausible to us to start with um so that's i guess my general kind of kind of general explanation of my my philosophical dispositions here yeah. So this seems seems like a good time to wrap up. Thanks so much, both of you, for, for coming on. I think this was a really interesting discussion. And uh, 
Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for the fun conversation.